Originally, this video's topic was going to be completely different, but then I started to realize that there's something wrong with California High Speed Rail's blended Caltrain corridor. In the last episode, we talked about Gilroy to San Jose, and there's nothing really wrong about that section. Both Caltrain and Amtrak barely use that corridor anyways. But the more I looked at the San Jose to San Francisco section, the more future problems I started to realize. Please exit through the rear door. Doors open. So we start off in San Jose Diridon Station. This station already services Amtrak's Capital Corridor, Ace Rail, and Caltrain, with the local light rail service, VTA, connecting the station to the rest of San Jose. If you want to learn more about that light rail system, TOD God has a great video on it. On top of VTA, BART plans to service this station in the future as well. Though, I can't believe I'm saying this, but there's a very real possibility that California High Speed Rail services the station first. And yeah, San Jose is also serviced by Amtrak's Coast of Starlight, but judging by the performance numbers on that long distance service, I don't think we could care less. Anyways, I think we all know by now that a significant portion of Caltrain's electrification was funded by California High Speed Rail. This is of course in exchange for track and trites. Under the California High Speed Rail Authority's page, they typically list this section as being under construction. Now, this is a little bit deceptive, because there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in order to get this corridor high-speed rail ready. Caltrain has been putting a lot more work in besides the electrification, such as grade separation projects and track replacements, but there's still a long way to go. All of this section is already double-tracked, but a lot of these stations don't have passing tracks. Only two stations on the entire line have passing tracks, and these are only here because of Caltrain's existing schedule patterns. And now we're out here trying to squeeze California High Speed Rail in the mix as well? Yeah, it's not too great. It actually reminds me a little bit of the Acela in Massachusetts. Even with the 150 mile per hour top speed, there are some Acela trains that find themselves stuck behind MBTA trains. There's simply not enough passing tracks. This leaves the Acela with extreme schedule padding, just to make sure that the train doesn't get delayed by any commuter rail trains. And with Caltrain making moves to become a legitimate regional rail service, and trying to do more frequent and off-peak services, we are definitely stretching the limits for the capacity of this rail line. According to the California High Speed Rail Authority, here's a brief look at what the schedule pattern would look like for this corridor. Yeah, that goes on for another three minutes, so I'm just gonna have this running in the background. This simulation shows three important things. Number one, train bunching. In order to make sure that Express California High Speed Rail trains aren't getting stuck behind Caltrain trains, Caltrain trains? Whatever. Caltrain has to operate back to back to back services. What I think the three services that the California High Speed Rail Authority is showing here are the Baby Bullet, the Limited Stop, and the Local Stop services that Caltrain has to offer. And with each of these trains operating hourly, we start to run into a little bit of an issue. That means every hour, a cluster of trains are going to be released. This only becomes a problem if Caltrain tries to up their frequency, which I'm sure they'll try to do in the future. No, no. Actually, Caltrain said it was a problem themselves. Over the past decade, I know, decade, that California High Speed Rail has been studying the Caltrain blended corridor, we've gone from five additional passing track sections to none. All cited as dismissed because of community disruptions. Recently, I've just seen the best railroad in North America not only triple track their main line, but also grade separated too. And yes, there were plenty of lawsuits from the communities that surrounded the tracks, but the project was delivered on time and a hundred million dollars under budget. This shows me that it still is possible for US transportation systems to upgrade their transportation networks, if taken seriously, to be on budget and on time. And from what I've seen and read, it seems like Caltrain is taking the passing tracks very seriously, especially because they are aware that it can affect their future planning for CalMod. But it seems like they're not making any moves because they don't have enough funding. The California High Speed Rail Authority too, obviously, if it hasn't already been memed about for the past decade, doesn't have enough funding either, and is probably extremely tired of lawsuits and making enemies with the communities that they plan to serve in the future. This is possibly why they're not putting on their big boy pants and actually making the passing tracks. Like the problem with all American public transportation, it simply boils down to lack of public funding. In the simulation, we can see the current segments of passing tracks in Brisbane and Sunnyvale being utilized. 
Again, I expect to see a lot of schedule padding. I wouldn't be surprised to see Caltrain services spending around 10 minutes in the station waiting for a California high speed rail train to pass. But that's just my experience with the northern section of the Northeast Corridor. I guess what I'm saying is, this service pattern isn't the prettiest. Speaking of train bunching, we also see that the California High Speed Rail Authority has to bunch up their trains as well. We actually get a unique look into the California High Speed Rail Authority's own schedule patterns. Throughout the day, there are several California High Speed Rail trains that terminate at San Jose. This means that we're going to see around three back-to-back -back California High Speed Rail trains come from the Central Valley. Two of those trains will continue on to San Francisco. One of them is an express train to San Francisco and the other one stops at Millbrae. Just like with Caltrain, the express train is scheduled to leave first to make sure that the express train can actually be an express train and not get stuck behind the local one. The top speed of the Caltrain corridor is going to be 110 miles per hour. Although service will initially start at 79 miles per hour. I think the next step after getting California High Speed operating here is to get the track segments up to 125 miles per hour. As I said in my hour long Brightline video, contrary to popular belief, the FRA can certify grade crossings for 125 miles per hour, but it's very difficult and very rare that the FRA does this. It would be a lot harder to do this north of San Jose, but from Gilroy to San Jose, I can definitely see it being a possibility. Okay, so let's take a look at Millbury Station. Here we have connection to BART again. This will provide California High Speed Road with a connection to the San Francisco International Airport. The Millbury Station will be expanded to be four tracks, with two side platform tracks for Caltrain and an island platform for California High Speed Rail. This is because Caltrain and California High Speed Rail currently use two different boarding level heights. Caltrain's new electric EMUs are able to use high level boarding, but Caltrain has instead uninstalled the high level boarding option and instead put temporary door plugs where the high level doors used to be. The Caltrain platform will be 700 feet while the California High Speed Rail platform will be 800 feet. The historic depot will have to be shifted back a little bit and the main concourse will have to be expanded. There will be a light maintenance facility in Brisbane and it is a little bit of an uncomfortable distance away from the main terminus, but uh... Yeah, they'll, they'll figure it out. Fun fact, the light maintenance facility is located on the old abandoned Southern Pacific Rail Yard. Its service steam transit was abandoned in 1980. The roundhouse, though decrepit, is still standing. It's crazy to think that half a century later, this rail yard will be brought back to life and servicing trains again. Cool, right? Oh my god! Anyways, welcome to San Francisco. The King Street Station will serve as a temporary terminus for California High Speed Rail until the downtown connection to the Salesforce Transit Center can be completed. This means that the 4th and King Street Station will have to be modified to add high level boarding. The 4th and King Street Station reminds me a lot of the Long Island City Station in New York. This station used to be heavily used but when Penn Station was built, almost all the trains got redirected there. Today, only one of the three island platforms are used, and the station mostly serves as a layup yard. This is what I expect to happen to 4th and King Street after the downtown extension is completed. So that's it for this episode. Next episode, we'll talk about the downtown extension. With that being said, if I earned your like and subscription, I love you, and if you made it this far in the video, thanks for watching. Thank you.